Welcome, searchers and seekers. We are still in the book of Samuel. We'll be dealing with chapters 16 and following. Uh, we've had the death of um, Saul, and we see at the end of chapter 15 that Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gil Gilgal. So a very dramatic ending to that uh, chapter. And uh, Saul has died, and something interesting happens at the end of chapter 15. And Yahweh was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. Uh, so that's a, uh, one of these many passages in which we see uh, the divine being Yahweh is very much anthropomorphized. He's really looked at as a human being who changes his mind, uh, who thinks different thoughts. Um, so as a human being writ large in some ways. And uh, we could see that as uh, an early stage of monotheism and uh, how are people going, it is the question of how are, how are people going to conceive of something as abstract as God? And so they would naturally uh, in some ways think of God as a rock or a mountain or uh, something vague, but something more concrete would be as a human being. So God would be conceived of as a sort of like a superhuman being, a human being uh, with similar powers, uh, but even greater powers, uh, instead of an abstract creator or the source of all being. So here we see in this kind of passage that God uh, feels sorry. So he feels emotion. Uh, he feels a sadness or sorrow or regret. Uh, so he, he has these very specific emotions over specific events. And not only that, but these are events that somehow he did or he contributed to. So he made Saul king over Israel, and now he regrets that. So God regrets something he has done. So God decided to do uh, some act, A, to make some situation occur, and then God regrets A. Uh, so he has a different state of mind, and this is very different from the conception of God in classical theism as uh, God is eternal, unchanging, always the same. God doesn't change from point to point, from time to time. God is above time. Uh, and what happens at time, God, in some sense, sees from all eternity. And God is not reacting to this and that particular event. So that's a very telling passage that chapter 15 ends on. And now that Saul has died, we are seeing uh, David. Uh, will become the uh, new king of Israel. And David is very, very important for Judaism and for Christianity. Um, in particular, uh, the, the kingdom of David uh, reaches uh, the, the largest extent. He's considered an ideal. He wasn't, uh, according to the text, just a military leader, uh, but he was very spiritual and, and religious, dances before the Lord, creates all these uh, psalms. Um, the idea that all the psalms are psalms of David is probably false. They were probably written over hundreds of years and not written just by David if he, in fact, wrote any of them. Uh, he's said to be a, mus a musician. and he is a hero and a model, and his Davidic empire is a model for uh, the, the Mashiach, the Messiah, who will be in his lineage. And for Christianity, uh, he is sort of a forerunner of Jesus, although the Christian concept of what a Messiah means had to undergo a radical change. Uh, Jesus, uh, as Messiah for Christians, uh, follows the pr the prophecies of the Davidic uh, messiahship, the Davidic uh, kingdom, but Jesus is a radically different kind of messiah. He's not a political military leader who brings Israel into its uh, rights as a large and powerful and glorious nation, uh, but more a, a messiah of the spirit uh, of love and kindness and loving one's uh, enemy and uh, the suffering servant. So in some ways, interesting that the Christians had to describe how Jesus is for them uh, in this continuation of the Davidic lineage uh, 
but really a totally different kind of person than David was. So when we're reading about David here, uh, we're, we're trying to think how uh, through those lenses, through the Christian lens and also through the later Jewish lens. As with Saul, it appears that we have several accounts of how David is selected as king. And again, we have one of the first ones is the anointing, uh, which seems in, in some ways uh, uh, unbelievable. It, it could be that David was a military leader. He had a lot of military success for somehow he was within the camp of Saul. Uh, and then he was at some point later uh, anointed. Or it could be that, uh, for especially those who are strict believers, he was, David was anointed first, and then uh, the um, later accounts of how he became king are a result of that first anointing. Uh, but then again, this, this story could be in some senses of propaganda, political propaganda. How, uh, how do we present David? After all, he probably was a, a ruthless military leader responsible for the deaths of many people. And how do we cast him as this humble shepherd, anointed when he's just a boy, uh, and, and considered after all, only after all the brothers are, are, are not selected? Uh, nevertheless, there are these different stories, and uh, we don't know exactly historically when they were written. So this is uh, the the time in place uh, where this occurs is probably around the year 1000, more or less. And we don't know when this text was written. It probably under, underwent several editions and probably uh, could well have had its final form about the year 500 after the exile after they look back at the kingship, and that's where we get a lot of our negative reviews of uh, kingship. Yeah, they, they're disillusioned with kingship. It didn't work out. Babylon conquered uh, Israel, so maybe king, kingship was not such a good idea. So these texts about uh, Samuel, Saul, and David could have been written over centuries, and, and in fact probably were. So we don't know historically what the relationship between Saul and David was. In the biblical text, Saul tries to kill David at least twice, um, and uh, David at one point cuts off part of his clothing and says, look, I, I had the opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. So there does seem to be uh, a lot of animosity between uh, Saul and David, uh, and, and that would make sense. Uh, David was not um, Saul's son, so it's not her hereditary monarchy, uh, but he may have been best friends with Jonathan, Saul's son, and may have married uh, one of Saul's daughters. Uh, we don't know really, uh, was David a ever a part of Saul's court? Did he fight with Saul? Uh, David is also sort of a mixed character. Uh, he's portrayed as perhaps extorting money from uh, Nabal in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. Um, and he actually fights with the, the Philistines at one point. Um, uh, in, in that day and age, we have this, uh, the, the border between Philistia and, say, Israel. Uh, you'd have a lot of small border towns, so those would be easy targets for being raided by one or the other side. It seems like there's a lot of that uh, going on. Uh, there's a lot of um, revenge, um, raiding. Uh, if one party raids one little village, uh, then the other one will invade another village. So it, it seems difficult, it seems hard to uh, to have a precise border there, and these things take time to be worked out, and they're worked out either by agreement or covenants or by war. Uh, so David grows up in this, uh, grows up in his career uh, probably as a guerrilla fighter, and the price, precise relationship with Saul uh, is probably not something we will ever know historically. And it's hard to deal with all the propaganda and uh, rewriting and ideology of the later 400 years uh, when this text could have been written. So it's very hard to get down historically. Another important aspect of David is that he comes from Bethlehem, which is in Judea, or Judah, 
in the south. And it appears that Saul's kingdom was mostly of the north of Israel per se uh, and not Judah. So David uh, represents a, a king who uh, rules over all of these tribes. He moves his capital to Jerusalem, uh, which is more towards the midpoint between uh, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And he is thus the first king over all of the tribes. One piece of evidence is sort of an argument from silence, but we we don't have any texts from Egypt or Mesopotamia that mention a large Davidic kingdom or the name David or Solomon. So there is no historical evidence from outside. Uh, archaeologically, uh, Jerusalem, the capital, uh, there are not a lot of remains uh, from that time. Uh, but the city has been rebuilt for thousands of years, so that's not absolutely conclusive. On the other hand, uh, this, this text is extremely detailed, and it, it's sort of hard to think that it's a total fabrication. Um, but there you are. That's, that seems to be the situation of scholarship uh, at this time. As I said, David moves his capital to Jerusalem which was a city controlled by people called the Jebusites, who were not part of the 12 tribes. And this is, was not really part of Judah per se, so it's right in between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So it's a way of unifying north and south. In many ways, like Washington, D.C., uh, was placed between the north and south of the colonial United States. In chapter 16, we have Yahweh say to Samuel, fill your horn with oil. So some type of ram's horn or animal horn with a, a plug in it uh, to hold the oil. So we get a sense of uh, how uh, anointing might be done, how the oil was held. In chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, verse 6, we hear, when they came, he looked to Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks on the heart. So this idea of choosing someone who's attractive, has presence, who's tall and strong and healthy uh, and uh, handsome is, is shown to be known. That's not the only criteria. But uh, that may seem a little crazy to us that, that that was even considered. But even in our day and age now, how a person looks is a criteria for leadership, uh, in, including presidents and uh, prime ministers, uh, even for popular elections. Uh, how the person presents is important. So we see a discussion of that here. Uh, in, in the biblical text, and we see Yahweh rejecting that as the only criteria. At the same time, in verse 12, he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready, talking about David, and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Uh, so <laughs> David does meet this criteria of being good-looking uh, as a man, uh, and that um, uh, it's somewhat funny. This is, is all a little bit funny, uh, but we've explained some of the serious reasons for it. And on the other hand, we don't have a lot of other reasons why God is anointing this person. It goes again with this story from Judges, God picking some out-of-the-way uh, person, and there, it's not quite clear that they have characteristics for leadership. Um, and in the biblical text here, it might be just be that it's God's selection, Yahweh's selection. And uh, then when Yahweh makes the selection, Yahweh's spirit uh, enters this person and fills this person. They are filled with the spirit of God. And that gives them sort of a charismatic uh, uh, leadership ability. In chapter 16, verse 14, 
Now the spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So that's what the text is saying. The text is very clear. It repeats that. Uh, that Saul is uh, tormented by Yahweh. So not only has his spirit left, uh, God is actively tormenting him. Uh, maybe Saul had some sort of uh, psychiatric illness uh, or just was an angry person. And this is a way of describing it, that, that God had, had done that. But again, this goes against the theological idea of the freedom of individual people. This is a very... Um, uh, active God. This is a God involved in people's personal histories. Uh, this is God controlling people's bodies, but also people's minds. And this really goes against what we would want to say is the ethical, moral, philosophical side of the Bible that focuses on human behavior and people's responsibility for their own behavior. Uh, again, these are very ancient texts. Um, 1,000 to 400 BCE, uh, people did not have an understanding of uh, psychology, and so perhaps this uh, explains people's behavior, that God sends a spirit and sort of influences them. Uh, again, that goes fundamentally against the idea of freedom, which is uh, philosophically very important to me. Accountability and responsibility are key issues, I think, for any uh, sort of philosophy. Uh, but just as the ancients did not understand meteorology, they didn't understand the weather, uh, they thought thunderstorms could be the presence of Yahweh, and they didn't understand biology, they didn't understand why uh, people and animals got pregnant, they thought, oh, that must be a result of spiritual forces or, or a decision by Yahweh. Uh, so here, too, we see uh, people at first just trying to figure out why things happen. In chapter 17, we have this very famous story of David and Goliath. Here we have um, the, the smaller man, uh, the younger, but who has skills and he has God on his side, uh, fighting the aggressive bully tyrant, uh, the champion fighter Goliath. And this is a, a highly readable story. It's, it's very famous. Uh, and uh, you, you need to understand this story if you want to understand Western art and, and literature. Uh, so the David and Goliath story is, is very famous, and I won't say a whole lot uh, about it, uh, except that um, uh, he chooses five smooth stones, and he has God on his side, and he slays uh, Goliath. And that appears to be one reason why he is special. He has God on his side. In 1752, it reads, The Troops of Israel and Judah. So here again we see this very important distinction. Uh, the 12 tribes were not at this time fully united. There are these, these two historical differences uh, between Israel and the north and Judah in the south. And that does seem to be uh, historically accurate. So the, the general sense of what ha is happening here uh, appears to be um, accurate in that sense. Um, they return, they rout the rest of the Philistines, and they go back. And there is this saying that the women in the streets are saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands, uh, which of course makes Saul envious, and th that starts this antipathy between Saul and David that we're going to see in the rest of First Samuel. So Saul is more than envious. Uh, he's murderous. He throws a spear at David uh, to pin him against the wall, but David uh, avoids that. Uh, that story is also repeated later in the text. Is that two events or just two stories about one event? And then Saul tries to create a situation in, in which um, David will die in battle, um, much like David will do with Bathsheba's husband. Uh, da David has promised Saul's elder daughter, Merab, but then uh, Saul takes away that offer after he 
Saul used it to motivate David to fight the Philistines. And so Saul is trying to get David killed. And so he wants him to fight the Philistines. And this is in chapter 18, 25 and following. The king desires no marriage present except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines that he may be avenged by, uh, on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Uh, so uh, David does this and he collects the 100 foreskins of um, 100 Philistines that he has killed. Uh, this really is a, uh, a bizarre and um, cruel and graphically violent passage in the Bible and uh, you wouldn't think it's there uh, unless you actually read this. Um, so it's uh, collecting the hundred foreskins to prove he killed a hundred uh, Philistines. So yeah, there was this brutal war between uh, Judah and Israel and the Philistines and, and this is just one graphic example of that and Saul is doing it to get David killed. So it turns out that David does marry another one of Saul's daughters, Michal, and yet again Saul is trying to kill David. He escapes out a window, maybe it's a window perched over the, the city gates, and Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed and put goat's hair over where the head was and then covered it with clothes. So it must have been somewhat of a large idol, uh, which is very fascinating because we have this idea that Michal had an idol, a religious idol, in her house. Uh, so we, we will often hear that uh, in the biblical text and the prophets that the, the people of Israel and Judah had uh, these idols. So perhaps the people were much more inclusive religiously. And we, we see in the text the desire to not have any sort of statuary representing any sort of gods and that only Yahweh should be worshipped and loved and there should be no idols for Yahweh uh, which is really a fascinating idea um, because the followers of Yahweh are really putting themselves at a disadvantage because I think the common people would want some sort of idol some sort of representation of their deity so the fact that that was not to be the case for Yahweh uh, is very fascinating. And here we have uh, one example among many uh, that the practice was uh, to have idols in, in many households. And archaeology has also shown that to be the case. In chapter 21, we have a um, passage that is somewhat well known because it's uh, in the New Testament. Uh, David does eat the holy bread that was set aside and so that is used as an example in the New Testament. So I call it to your attention here, chapter 21. Chapter 25 is an interesting uh, chapter. Um, it's the chapter of Nabal and his daughter Abigail. Um, David will eventually marry Abigail. Uh, but the disagreement here seems to be that Nabal does not give David any sort of uh, support in terms of material or money or food. Uh, and so you could look at this as sort of how David operated uh, in this sense as a sort of guerrilla warrior, uh, guerrilla commander. He, he needed to feed his troops and pay his troops and get weapons uh, for his troops and yet <clears throat> they couldn't always be farming or shepherding so he relied on in this case maybe something like extortion uh, of, of locals to, to try to get them to contribute. He marries Abigail which is now his second wife uh, so here we see David even before he is king has more than one wife and there's no negative um, criticism of this in the biblical text, it seems that polygamy is, is very normal, it, it's not criticized, it's not mentioned as a sin or a bad thing, and this conforms with much of human society in which um, men could have 
uh, more than one wife. And here we see an example of this with David. And uh, remember, David is sort of an exemplar of the best. Uh, the Messiah, the Mashiach, is going to be like David. Uh, so we, I think, we'll find this in education about uh, human relationships and this ideal of monogamy that has come to be the norm in society was not always the norm. And back in those ancient times, if men are dying in battle, it, it might be the case that there are fewer men. So uh, there would be a, a lot of reasons for this. Chapter 28 is also a fascinating story. Uh, Saul goes to the witch of Endor, the uh, medium, the seer of Endor, and he doesn't know what to do uh, in battle. Uh, so he wants to talk to Samuel again. Samuel has died, um, and yet Samuel is brought back into the presence of this medium. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing story, which really, you know, <laughs> causes us to uh, disbelieve the historicity of this account. Saul receives some bad news from Samuel. Uh, Samuel comes back and tells him that he will die at the, at the hands of the Philistines uh, because of his, uh, his failures, for instance, not killing King Agag. Uh, you and your sons shall be with me tomorrow, promises that you're going to die tomorrow. And Yahweh will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So again, uh, again, the ignorance of the times and not not trying not accepting a um, a physical physicalist or materialist view of uh, military success. Just as there there's there's ignorance of meteorology. There's ignorance of, of biology. There's ignorance of the free interactions of a military conflict and. Those, uh, that ignorance is filled in with Yahweh giving over one side or another. And in fact, Saul dies the next day. Uh, his army is defeated, so he falls on his sword. His body is found by the Philistines. They cut off his head. They, they steal his armor. And they put his armor in the temple of Astarte. And uh, scholars note that that could be really any goddess because Astarte was just uh, a, a specific goddess but also a general name for uh, any sort of non-Israeli female deity. And it could actually refer to the goddess of Beth Shan whose name was Antit. Uh, so we actually have discovered uh, that. So here we have the end of Saul very dramatically um, and as a result of Yahweh taking back his support and his spirit from Saul and uh, allowing the Philistines to uh, win this battle that ends with the death of Saul.